This is the Wednesday night Bible study for April the 8th, 2020, the Lone Star Missionary Baptist Church. We're thankful that you've chose to listen tonight, whether you're a church member or just someone who is uh, watching this on our YouTube channel. Uh, we encourage you to open your Bibles with us and read along. We want to turn to several scriptures tonight to deal with a particular thought that has been on my heart throughout the week. Before we do, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful how that you've blessed us. You've been good to us in so many ways, most of all, that you provided us a Savior in and through your Son, Jesus Christ. Now, Heavenly Father, as we open your word tonight, I pray that you open the eyes of our understanding. I pray that we could see the wonderful things that you have for us in your word, that our eyes could be and our minds can be enlightened. We could grow closer to you. For those that have never accepted Jesus Christ, I pray they would see there's no substitute uh, for Christ. There's, there's no other option that you've made one way for man to be redeemed, and that's through the blood of your precious Son. Again, we're thankful for this. Be with those who are uh, suffering uh, through this terrible disease that's sweeping through our land. I pray for those that are caring for them, for their families. So many that's in uh, great need today. Help us to all realize our need of you on a daily basis. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We want to uh, deal with uh, really a, a phrase that's been on my heart through the week. And uh, it's a phrase that we use from time to time in prayer. We use it uh, in some of our songs has uh, this particular phrase in it. Certainly in preaching that uh, as ministers of the gospel that we mention this from time to time. And as you'll see tonight, if you don't already know that throughout the scriptures that this terminology is used several times but uh, I, I feel like that this is a phrase or a term that many times we use and we really don't understand it and yet that we just have heard it and it's become part of our vocabulary as as people who go to church and people who read our bibles and uh, yet that we if somebody were to ask us Really, what does it mean? You know, how would we respond? And I understand that uh, we maybe never in this life know the fullness of it. Uh, but what I want to do tonight is just take the scriptures. And uh, the Bible says that we're to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. And the Bible is one that when we study it, because it is a living word, uh, that it teaches us. And the Holy Spirit teaches us. And we can, uh, and nothing wrong with looking at outside sources. The Lord's given uh, many people the wonderful gifts of teaching and uh, we're thankful for those and those that instruct us whether it be through the spoken word or through the written word we're grateful for that uh, but I want to help you see tonight that many times you can just open the scriptures and uh, as the Lord reveals it to you that you can see and have questions answered that maybe that you have had questions about uh, for some time now I want to ask you this question to start with tonight where is Jesus today where is Jesus today? It's uh, Easter week. I know with the virus situation that there's not a lot of uh, attention maybe been given to Easter this year as there ordinarily has been. Uh, I know that uh, with just extraordinary times, a lot, lot going on, but yet that uh, this Sunday is Easter Sunday. Of course, this Friday be Good Friday. And uh, we know that Jesus is not dead that he did not stay in that tomb outside Jerusalem. Satan tried everything within his power to keep him there, and yet that uh, it was totally uh, fruitless on Satan's part because early that Sunday morning, uh, that stone was rolled away, and Christ came forth out of the grave victorious, and he lives forevermore. He's alive, and that's what, we, uh, that's what our hope is resting in today is a living Savior. But where is Jesus today? Where is Jesus today? I want us to turn and read. I would encourage you to just follow along with me tonight in our study. Uh, go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The book of Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to begin by answering this question. I feel like that you've probably already answered it. You probably already are very aware of where Jesus is today. But let's read it here in Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The writer of Hebrews writes, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So certainly the answer to the question that I ask you, that where is Jesus today, that's answered very plainly, very clearly here in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, and in many other places uh, in the New Testament. And we won't look at all of those tonight, but look at some. He said that the one who suffered, the one who died and was buried, that he's not there, but he is today, he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me turn back to another scripture in Colossians chapter 3, a very similar statement that's made here concerning uh, where Jesus is today. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, Paul wrote, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So we just read in the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 12 that Christ is at the right hand of God. And now we read here in Colossians uh, chapter uh, 3 and verse 1 that Christ is seated. It says where Christ sitteth. Notice that is present tense where he sitteth on the right hand of God. And he tells us that uh, that place is a place that's above. That place is in heaven at the very throne of God. And we're to seek those things which are the spiritual things, the heavenly things, the enduring things, and not the temporal things. Uh, because that uh, we are risen with Christ. We sing a song. Uh, I remember the song, I guess, all my life. It's an older song. But the title of the song is, I See Jesus. And we can think back in our hearts and our minds to Acts chapter 7, as Stephen would preach there before the Sanhedrin, as he had been taken in. And he stood before them, and he uh, preached uh, the the truth out of the scriptures, which is the Old Testament, that they had in, those, in, in that day. And he began to preach to them the history of the nation of Israel and how that uh, God had promised a Savior. And then that he would make the statement on down toward the latter part of the chapter that the just one, that he came. And that just one is Jesus Christ. And he, uh, he accused them, and which was a true accusation, of they were the ones who had betrayed and murdered the just one, the Savior, Jesus. And the scripture says that they were cut to the heart and they cast Stephen out of the city and they stoned him with stones. But we know very well that as they begin to stone him with stones, the scripture says that Stephen looked up into heaven and it said that he saw the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So Stephen here, before that he uh, left this world before he took his final breath that he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus and Jesus was standing on the right hand of God and what a welcome that was for Stephen as he entered into heaven uh, to have Jesus standing there on the right hand of God to welcome him in glory so for a few minutes tonight I want us to think about that statement the right hand of the father that we make that statement, we use it again in our prayers, in preaching, that Jesus today is at the right hand of the Father. Well, what does that really mean? What What are we saying when we say that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father? Again, I wouldn't know all the depths of, of, of this, and uh, yet that uh, I would like, again, to take some scriptures and look at those tonight. But I want to point out five things that, as I studied uh, through this and looked at these scriptures, the five things that... I've discovered concerning the right hand of the Father. Go back to Acts chapter 2, if you're following along with me tonight. And I want to, again, encourage you to do so. In the book of Acts chapter 2, uh, here on the day of Pentecost, that as Peter would preach uh, there to those that were gathered in Jerusalem, he made this statement uh, concerning uh, Jesus at the right hand of the Father. In verse 31, he, he said this, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, 
which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The first thing I want you to see tonight about the right hand of the Father is that it's a place of honor. It's a place of honor. And notice what Peter said here, therefore being, verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. Exalted. The right hand of the Father is an exalted place. You think about God being the creator, he being the king, the ruler over this universe. To have the exalted position of being at his right hand. We still use that terminology sometimes. Maybe someone who is, uh, is, is highly honored uh, by an individual that we say that that's, you know, their right hand man or that's their wing man. And so here it says that Christ being by the right hand of God exalted. There's a wonderful Old Testament example of this. I, I won't turn back. I just want to refer to it. It's back in the book of first Kings chapter two that as Bathsheba would be asked to go into Solomon, who was actually her son, king at that time, she would be asked to go in and make a request uh, unto him. And it says that as she went into him, that he rose up off the throne and he bowed, and there was a seat that was placed there, and she sat down on his right hand. Now you think of someone that uh, a king would honor, and uh, certainly the king would honor his mother. And so that Bathsheba was placed there on the right hand in that position of honor. (coughs) Excuse me. And so that uh, Jesus here, that he is in a place of honor at the right hand of the Father. And we find that that, uh, alluded to again in the book of Philippians chapter 2, in a very familiar passage of Scripture. He says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father." So that uh, we find here that because that Christ was willing to completely and totally humble himself, he was completely obedient to the will of the Father. He was willing to come here and, and give of himself in every way that God hath highly exalted him. And so he's placed him in that, uh, in that place of honor there at the right hand of the Father. Remember that uh, the, the mother of Zebedee's children, James and John, that she went to Jesus asking him that if she would, if one could sit on his right hand, another on the left in his kingdom. She wanted them to have an exalted place, a place of honor uh, in the kingdom. And the Bible tells us this, that the saints who are faithful, that that they will have an exalted place uh, in the kingdom of Christ. So it's a place of honor. The second thing I want to uh, share with you concerning the right hand of the Father is that it's a place of expectancy, a place of expectancy. And this particular a verse is given to us several times in the uh, in the New Testament. The New Testament writers quoting this from David, but I'm going to read it uh, read it to you out of the book of Psalms in Psalm chapter 110. The Scripture says, "The Lord, verse one, the Lord said unto my Lord, this is David, the the Lord speaking of of God, said unto my Lord, that's of Christ, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool." So the right hand of the Father is a place of expectancy. It's a place of honor, and it's also a place of expectancy. He said that God said unto the unto Christ, God the Father said unto the Son, Sit thou at my right hand until, until. There's something that's going to happen until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now we know that uh, at the end of the great tribulation period that Christ is going to come back to this earth. And he's going to come not as the gentle lamb, but he's going to come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's going to rule with a rod of iron uh, over uh, this earth. And he's going to uh, put down all enemies. Uh, we find in the book of Revelation over in the last uh, couple of chapters 
that the last enemy, or we actually in First Corinthians 15, we read this, that the last enemy that is to be destroyed is death. And he'll put down all enemies. He'll put down all uh, adversaries. All the enemies of the Lord will be destroyed. And again, what a wonderful day that will be. And so Christ is there, and he's expecting the opportunity, expecting that time when he's going to come, and he's going to put down all adversary and all the enemies. You think about Satan as he'd be placed in that bottomless uh, pit. He'll be chained up, and then at the end of that, he'll go out for a little season, and he'll gather uh, people from the four corners of the earth, and uh, then we read that he'll be totally annihilated uh, by the power of God, and so that Christ is, is the right hand of the Father in a place of expectancy. The third thing I want to point out to you tonight, we find in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, that the right hand of the Father is a place of power, and it's a place of authority. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now listen to how he describes it, describes Christ, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So the right hand of the Father is a place of power. It's a place of authority that he has placed him far above all of these powers, all these dominions, all these kingdoms that would be here upon this earth. He's given him a name. There's no other name under heaven whereby that we must be saved. We find in Acts chapter 4. But he's given him a name above every name. And it says that he's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. You see, the church is not uh, under the authority of some man. It's not under the authority of some board or organization, but the church is under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid for it with his precious blood. So the right hand of the Father is a place of power, and it's a place of authority. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, listen to the statements that are made here concerning Christ in verse 22, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22, who is speaking of Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Isn't that a comfort to us tonight, even in this time of turmoil and the great disturbance here in the world, that uh, the ultimate power and authority is not coming from uh, the CDC, it's not coming from Washington. It's not coming out of Brussels. It's not coming out of any of these other places. But the ultimate authority uh, is found in in the Lord Jesus Christ. That He's gone into heaven, and he's at the right hand of God, angels, authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. The fourth thing I want to mention to you tonight, and this, again, is something that's a great comfort to us. We find in Romans chapter 8 that the right hand of the Father is a place of intercession. It's a place of intercession Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Questions asked, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, listen to this, who also maketh intercession for us. You see, we read that there's an accuser of the brethren. One day he's going to be cast down for good. But today that he's accusing us before the Father. But we have an advocate, we have an intercessor at the right hand of the Father, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He maketh, again, that's present tense. He is currently making intercession for us. Now, I read this in studying that the Sanhedrin Council, the very council that Stephen was uh, preaching to uh, that condemned him and then would give the authority for him to be stoned, that uh, there were 70 members of that Sanhedrin council and that on either side of the, you want to call it the president or uh, the the one in charge of the Sanhedrin council, on either side that there was a secretary, one on the right, one on the left, 
And when people would stand before the Sanhedrin and that uh, the verdict would be issued, uh, that the secretary on the left, that uh, that individual was responsible for the sentences of condemnation. And the secretary on the right, that that secretary was responsible for the sentences or for the uh, verdicts of acquittal. And certainly that uh, we are not condemned uh, for those that there is no condemnation for them who are in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus on the right hand, that he ever liveth to make an intercession uh, for us, that we don't have to worry about being condemned. We don't ever have to worry about being separated from God because Christ is there making intercession for us. So the right hand of the Father is a place of intercession. And the last thing I want to deal with tonight, we find in, back in the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, that the right hand of the Father is a place of completion. The right hand of the Father is a place of completion. Verse 1, Hebrews chapter 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he hath by him when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then he would go on over in the book of Hebrews chapter 10. These two verses go along with each other. So let me go ahead and read these. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. It says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now you think about the the, the rest of, of God in creation and you think about the rest here of, of Christ as he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God that these, these priests under the Old Testament dispensation that day after day after day they had to continually offer those things that could never take away sins. But it said this man, after he offered one sacrifice forever, that he sat down on the right hand of God. That speaks to the fact that his work was finished. That he had accomplished that, that he had been sent to do, uh, to redeem mankind from his sins. And so the right hand of the Father, as Christ sits there, that is evidence, plain evidence, that he his work is finished. That he has done what's necessary for the redemption of mankind. Now, in conclusion tonight, uh, I want to remind you of this. Who is it that's seated at the right hand of God? It's the one who is highly exalted. It's the one who's in the place of honor, the place of, of power, the one who's finished the work, the one who has paid the price for our redemption. It's not Confucius. It's not Muhammad. It's not some religious group. It's not the Virgin Mary. It's none of those, but it is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm chapter 2, the scripture says, kiss the son. Kiss the son. And tonight, that I want to ask you, have you kissed the son? Have you accepted the Son as your Savior? I think it's very, very plain. I know it's very, very plain in the Scriptures because the Bible says that you're without excuse. When you stand before God one day, dear friend, whoever you may be, when you stand before God one day, it's not going to matter what you've done, what you haven't done as far as the earthly things. It's not going to matter how many times you went to church. It's not going to matter the good things, the good deeds that you may have done, that the monetary contributions that you may have given. It's not going to matter how many times that you've been baptized. It's not going to matter uh, any, any of those other things. And I could go through a whole long list of things. Uh, you, wh whatever it is that you're, uh, that, that you're basing uh, your salvation on, if it's anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, you can put it on that list of things that will not work. But the Scripture is very plain that the Son, He's the answer. There is no other way apart from Jesus Christ. A man cannot be saved and have eternal life. We read in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that a man cannot be saved and have eternal life by his works. The scripture says this 
and read this to you and we'll try to close. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. What is the that there? It's salvation. Salvation is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Tonight, dear friend, is your eternity based on what you've done? Or is your eternity based on what Christ has done for you? If if your faith and your hope is in what you have done, you're in the same position that Saul of Tarsus was in. He was trusting the fact that, hey, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Benjamin. I, I, of, I, I was uh, very zealous. All of these things that I did. But he said, that that was gained to me. He said, all that was loss for Christ. I couldn't, he said, I couldn't be saved based on any of those things. But he said this, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Dear friend, will you count for loss? Will you count as dung all of your good works? And would you count for your Savior, Jesus Christ? That's God's plan. Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father, the exalted one, the Savior. Oh, friend, if you've not trusted him, I beg you and I plead with you to accept him. Heavenly Father, take the message tonight. Use it for your honor and glory. I'm thankful that we have an advocate, we have a high priest, we have one that's seated at your right hand, and that he has completed his work, that he's done all that's necessary, that you've placed him in that position of of power and authority and and honor, and that exalted position, and knowing that one day that he's coming again to get us, and then he's coming back to this earth to rule and to reign. Father, I pray for those that have not accepted Jesus Christ. I pray they would see that's the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.